Hello and welcome everyone to our series Perspectives on Pedagogy. Uh, this is the fourth installment and so far we've been looking at various ways that we as instructors can improve our uh, techniques. Uh, we looked at um, active learning last, last time we met. We've looked at allyship in the classroom and we've also looked at GTAs and teaching. Today, we're going to do something different. We're going to flip things around. We're going to actually ask the students what do they think. Uh, we're going to ask them what they think are good te techniques to help them learn and what they think are less good techniques. I'm absolutely delighted that today joining us is the Fairmount College uh, Student Advisory Council, no less. And I'm going to go straight to asking Brian Bolton to introduce them. And if you do not know Brian, Brian is our Associate Dean for Student Success. So this is all about student success. He also coordinates the Faculty College Student Advisory Council meetings and helps guide them through uh, what it means for them to represent the student body to uh, the Dean and to the college. So Brian, I will hand over to you. So, so this, um, this panel was conceived of me meeting with my student advisory group um, every two weeks and every two weeks they bring issues and their, their perspective and what's going on in the college to the Dean's office. And they, this is a group that has a direct audience with the Dean every couple of weeks and they can tell him what's going on in the college. And so this panel came about as a result of hearing from students in our college and what's going on and what's beneficial and what's not. And so I have three of the, the members of the Fairmont College Student Advisory Committee with us today, and I'm gonna go around and have them introduce themselves. And so I'll start with Laura Cunningham, our, our president of our, um, our council here in the college. So Laura? Yes, so my name is Laura Cunningham. I'm a senior here at Wichita State studying political science and psychology. Um, I'll be attending Washburn Law in the fall, so that's really exciting. Um, yeah, I'm really involved on campus. You know, I'm involved in student government, pre-law. I'm involved in um, the Ambassador for Diversity and Inclusion and in this organization. So I really know my way around campus. Thank you, Laura. Next, I'll, I'll have Sonia introduce herself. Um, so my name is Sonia. I'm also a senior here at Wichita State, um, studying political science and minoring in criminal justice. Um, I was also very involved in campus. Now that the year's coming to the end, it's getting a little bit less involved, but I was the president of the Pre-Law Student Association, vice president of the Feminists on Campus Uniting Students Organization, and I am the secretary for the Fairmont College Student Advisory Council. Thank and I will you. also be attending Washburn, sorry. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much. And then Eric. I'm Eric Harrison. I uh, received my bachelor's degree in uh, philosophy last December. Now I'm working on uh, majoring in English and minoring in art. Uh, just uh, been around for quite a while. And we appreciate your perspective, Eric. Thank you. So I'm going to I'm going to start off with um, a question that I think is going to help frame this conversation today. So, taking that all of you are are seniors this year, what's going to stand out for you about your educational experiences at Wichita State? And I, it, just any one of you can start off. So, what's going to stand out for you about your educational experiences at Wichita State? I would say. What stands out the most is the relationships I've made, the people I've uh, gotten to know, my professors, uh, and all the help they've given me get where I am and hopefully get where I'm going. Okay. No, I definitely agree. Um, as a transfer student, I only had two years here at Wichita State, and I feel like I've built more relationships in the past two years than I felt like was possible here. I really enjoy my faculty. I work in the political science department as a student worker. So I have the privilege of making a little bit more connections with faculty. And I just really appreciate all the opportunities that I've been able to get through it. 
Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think community is a big aspect of my positive experience at WSU. I think that meeting professors who I really make a connection with, that is what really flourishes my passion and what really inspires me to continue my education. So that's a really big part, but also the students, like I always feel very comfortable in class talking to my peers and building this sense of community around students and faculty. So that, that's really a nice segue into the, the next kind of cluster of questions around. So what is it that professors, faculty, instructors can do to build this, these relationships and this sense of community? What is it that we can do to help build that sense of relationship and community? Um, I think just being personable. I feel like, you know, as students, we can tell when faculty are here to kind of just teach a class and get through their day. Um, but, you know, the classes that have stood out the most are the ones where professors aren't just teaching, but they're also, you know, getting to know their students and making sure that everyone's doing okay and, you know, understanding the material versus just kind of like that Socratic method of I'm teaching and I'm asking questions and we're getting kind of through the day. And there's not really a lot of classes here in my experience, I think, that have been like that. I'm very grateful as a political science major that a lot of my professors aren't like that. But I do know in some of like the um, required classes that I had to take for my degree, um, not political science based, um, that I'd see that a lot. And it kind of pushes back my comfortability to be able to like come to them with a question if I'm struggling just because I feel like they're only there during that short amount of time, maybe their office hours. There's not really a lot of like personability to it, I guess. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I would add to that and say that uh, certainly since I've returned, uh, the professors I've had made an effort to include everybody's input and uh, recognize it so that uh, you're not just a name on the page and uh, actually give you feedback on your ideas. It's uh, really helpful to stimulate your own thinking. Yeah, I mean, like, I think the professors who specifically and very intentionally engage in conversation outside of class is truly the key piece, whether that's before or after class. The professors who leave the room available for students to ask questions or approach them about topics, I think that connection is really important. But also, if you notice that your student is interested in particular topics, potentially sending them articles or engaging them in conversations about those topics will make them feel heard and connected. And I, I really notice the professors who really do notice what I'm passionate about and intentionally send me information or scholarships or internships regarding the areas that I'm interested in. I think this, this kind of ties to a, another question that I have for the panelists today, and that's Okay, so oftentimes we have large numbers of students. We're um, doing multiple things as, as professors at the university, but how can we keep students involved and engaged in, especially whenever we have larger classes? So how do we keep students engaged, involved when there's so much going on in, in our worlds? What can we do? Well, I would say there's three of my professors on here right now that exhibited uh, what I would say is most important, and that's the passion for teaching and their subject. And that kind of uh, is infectious in the classroom when you see that and they're, they're ready to go, uh, psyched up just two of them bounce, they're so passionate. <laughs> One of them I only had the pleasure of being on Zoom with, but uh, hopefully now that I'm in the English department, uh, we'll see a little more of him. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'd say 
I, I'd, I'll go along with that as well, but I'd also say maybe ask, um, like uh, during the first week of classes or the first day that you guys go through your syllabi, maybe kind of, you know, get that conversation going as well. Cause especially during COVID, you know, we were on Zoom a lot of the time, a lot of the information that we retained wasn't very much. Um, there wasn't really a lot to, I guess, grow from that. And so, you know, my my teaching, uh, my teaching, sorry, my learning methods a lot different than, you know, Laura's or Eric's and maybe just kind of opening that conversation of, hey, you know, I don't want this to just be a lecture based class because a lot of students respectfully are, not I don't feel like are able to grasp a lot of the information in a lecture based class, just kind of opening up that conversation of like what works best for you and maybe kind of tweaking the the teaching method that you have just a little bit, not like the whole curriculum change or anything like that, but just maybe, hey, if my students are wanting more discussion-based classes, like personally, I love discussion-based classes. I love being able to engage with the other students, with the professor, with the um, information that I'm getting. If your students want a discussion-based class, maybe kind of open that floor up for them, engage them a little bit more than just kind of teaching them from the front of the class and then just sending them on their way when the hour and 15 is over. I have to agree because the collaborative approach in my experience has been the most impactful. And when I walk away from those classes, I truly feel like I've gained a lot of knowledge or experience. And specifically, um, I have a class this semester with Dr. Shaw and it's negotiation diplomacy. So everybody is assigned a role that we have to play in a simulation. And so it's very collaborative. It's like a game. And it's teaching us how to conduct ourselves, how to do research about our own roles, how to really take that on and implement it in real life scenarios. So I think that has been a really great learning experience because that's what opens you up to your peers and your professor. So well, and I'd, I'd have to add, uh, my professors have always uh, given real life examples of what we're discussing so that you actually see where you be using it and uh, one thing dr dufresne did was made use of the uh, message board on zoom uh, we probably filled that up i don't know what kind of limit it has but I, i've never seen a class where there was so much uh, interaction between the students on that message board. That's, that's really nice. But you guys are just, um, you're segueing me into the next questions every time. So do you have a favorite professor or professors and what did they do to earn your, earn this honor? Well, I would say what I consider my mentors are uh, Dr. Philippa and Dr. Lou, simply because uh, they taught the subject that interests me the most, which is Asian philosophy. However, it's hard to say that the others aren't favorites of mine as well. Uh, Dr. Bondi, Dr. Hepburn, Dr. Dufresne, they all were just amazing and did so much for my learning. So I'm gonna, I'm going to follow that up with you and say what what were the qualities that they had that well the qualities uh dr Philippa were just uh, we would if i saw him at starbucks uh i'd buy him a coffee or he'd buy me one and just was very personable we'd discuss our philosophy as well as uh, just what going on in our daily life and uh dr lou uh, would bring food <laughs> which was <laughs> always good uh, there's and, those two things that stand out so i'm gonna go with sonia and, and laura and ask you the same question do you have a do you have a favorite and what qualities did they bring with them that made them your favorites I'll go. Um, so I, like I said, I work in the political science department. So I really enjoy all the faculty in the political science department, several of which are actually on this call. Um, but somebody who really stood out to me was Dr. Um, Alex Middlewood in the political science department. 
Um, she had personal character characteristics qualities. Um, I had a personal situation happen the end of last semester where I actually was going to prolong my degree and take the semester off. And she is one of the main reasons why I decided to stay. And she helped motivate me and push me forward. And, you know, I, I'm very grateful for her. There's not a lot of there's not enough words to say to her exactly how grateful I am to her. Um, she was here, but she's actually in New York, which is really fun for the Model UN. Um, but I love seeing her in the office. Um, she's really friendly. She's somebody that I know that I can talk to about literally anything going on. Um, and I'm just really grateful for her. Thank you, Sonia. Son. Um, so for me, um... I think one of the most impactful professors I've had is actually in this chat as well, um, Dr. Chang. For me, it was really important as you know, a biracial Asian American to feel represented in the classroom. And this was the very first time in my entire life where I actually felt that way. Um, I've never had a female Asian professor in my entire life. So that was really important to me. But she also pushed me in many ways to you know, be proud of myself, be proud of my identity, and be proud of my heritage and the history that comes with it. And, you know, she was also very informative of every single class that I took with her. And, you know, I feel like she really built that passion in me for politics, especially on like a global perspective. And now I'm going to ask you another question here that I, I think Imagine you could go back and talk to your freshman self and um, do things differently at Wichita State. So travel back in time, you get in that hot tub that takes you back and you, you say to your, yourself in the past, I need to change these things. What would those changes be? Well, personally, from a transfer student perspective, I came here the fall of 21. Um, so like I said, my last two years of undergrad, um, as a freshman in 2018, I tried to avoid Wichita State, not because I didn't like the school or anything, but I tried, I wanted to branch out from the school that I grew up with my peers in. And if I could go back, I would definitely tell myself not to do that. Um, because like I said, the amount of connections I've built and the education that I've gotten and the organizations that I've been involved with in just two years just seems crazy to me. And I really wish that I would have given myself the benefit of the doubt and come here as a freshman and be able to get the experience that I've enjoyed for the past two years for four years. And, and even back then, I didn't know I wanted to be a political science major. I originally was going into business. And so, I mean, I would tell myself not to do business. But, you know, aside from that, if I did come here for business and decide to change my um, my route. I do know that like Dr. M, she's the undergrad advisor for political science. So regardless, like no matter what, I, I knew that I would be in great hands. And so I really wish I wouldn't have beat myself up to the point of not coming to Wichita State because I really enjoy all all the opportunities that I've gotten from from the school here. Thank you. Um, For me, like my first year at uh, Wichita State, you know, like it was half normal, half pandemic, because I started in the fall of 19. Um, but besides that, even, there was just a lot of growing pains um, as a first-generation college student and second-generation American. Like, my parents weren't able to help me and guide me in ways that maybe I, if I had a mentor, they could have helped me a lot. Um, but I didn't really make strong connections with any you know, any organization, any mentor, professor at Wichita State until I started getting involved in student government my junior year. So I would definitely go back and try to get more involved and be a little bit more outgoing. Mine's pretty simple. I should have <laughs> stayed and finished and not taken so long to finish. Uh, College education just it doesn't matter what subject you pick it it helps you and no matter what job you may end up in so makes you an all around better person and uh, waiting so long I see now some things that I would have liked to have done uh, maybe even well I would like to get my PhD if uh, 
it was possible, but, uh, and become one of these fine people who's been teaching me, but I think I waited a little too long. Oh, there's time. We, we have we have that time machine that moves us around. With the that's correct. Uh, that's the that's the right attitude. That's that's right. So, I we've come to a point where I think this is the opportunity for our audience to ask of our panelists questions they would like to know about students. And, and this, this is my advisory board, and this is our dean's office's advisory board. This group of students is very open and honest with us when things are going well and when things are not going well. Um, and that's why we have an advisory board in this college. And so this is our opportunity to ask, you know, what is going well? What might we need to improve on? as instructors and professors at Wichita State. So I will open it up to the um, audience to ask our students anything that they would like to ask them. And I'm sure they will answer it for you. Yes, Brian. Hi, um, good to see you all. Um, sorry, I was a little bit late. Uh, so one of you mentioned earlier I think it was Laura about collaborations in the classroom and, and how that was a good experience. And I do a lot of group work in my logic course and in my and uh, the other courses I teach. But it occurred to me the other day on the basis of a specific incident that that might actually be exclusionary for some students, that some students really aren't comfortable participating in group activities like that. So uh, is that your experience or what do you what would you suggest I do to sort of ameliorate that problem? Is this to imply that the individual you're speaking about likes to do independent work? Uh, they're just not comfortable speaking out in group in group group settings. It's yeah, I mean, I've experienced this a lot in classes that I've had where there are students who are shyer and quieter and maybe are less open to speaking up about how they feel. And for me personally, when I'm in those smaller groups, it's really important for me as one of those more outspoken individuals to give those people room to speak. Um, and I really think that's important, giving them the opportunity to lead, giving them the opportunity to speak and express themselves. And sometimes that might be suppressing other students that may speak out all the time or very frequently. And sometimes that's just what is the most appropriate manner to go about it is there are shyer students and you really have to put the spotlight on them to let them shine. Right, awesome. I would oh, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I think it's necessary to uh, promote group discussions. And I know in your class and in Dr. Bondi's class, there are classmates I had that wouldn't talk. And I knew they had good ideas because I'd talk to them. And I don't know if you can always have students help you engage them but if that's possible i think that's one avenue to take is to recognize who can possibly draw the others in so i i don't think i would abandon that approach uh, i always you know i like to talk <laughs> so I also agree. I think it gets a little tricky because we do have like a lot of introverted students. I see them a lot in my classes as well. And like Laura and Eric, I do try to extend and, you know, open the floor up to them when we're in group work and say, like, what do you think? But, you know, you can't you can't please everybody. I feel like, you know, you can't force them to speak if they don't want to. Just giving them the environment that makes it comfortable for them, you know, maybe on their way out or their way and ask them how their day is doing, like get that conversation kind of starting with them. Cause most of the time students, we come into class with our headphones in, sit down, type our notes, maybe converse a little bit and then leave. So kind of maybe, maybe opening that floor and like letting this student or these students that are a little bit more introverted feel a little bit more comfortable in, their, in your class to, you know, make them feel like they can speak out and they can talk to students and they can talk to you. And that's definitely a journey in itself. 
Um, but like I said in, in earlier, I think it makes the difference when professors are a little bit more personable, um, just because even if that means being just a little bit extra personable to these students that need that extra grace and that extra you know, kindness and that extra just hand, I think it makes all the difference because we all have bad days, we all have good days, but when it's a whole semester of a student not engaging, you know, there could be stuff going on or maybe they just need that extra, that extra hand, I feel like. Well, just being recognized, uh, just calling on them and uh, what do you think? Uh, sometimes that's all it takes. Sometimes you have to do that more than once because it takes a while to feel comfortable sometimes for the the younger ones, for sure. Thank you. That's all excellent advice. Awesome. So I, I think we do have another question from the audience from Jessica Newman. Hi. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you all to all three of you. This has been awesome. It's been really nice to get to hear from the student perspective. I actually have a question related to what Brian asked. So in regards to group work, a lot of my assignments are uh, project based. So we don't necessarily do a lot of papers or tests or things like that, but they're project based. And I've kind of gone back and forth between having those projects be mainly individual and having them be group. Uh, you know, I'm a big proponent of in-class group work. The, the struggle I have sometimes is that schedules make it very challenging for students to get together outside of class. So I guess my question in that is, when it comes to group work, you all seem very pro that. Does that end when the class ends? Or are you okay with sometimes getting collaborative group projects that do require a little more work outside of class? So I have wonderful advice for that because I actually have a class right now that is a it's a collaborative research class for honors college um, and something that my teacher does. And I don't know exactly how you um, like teach during the days that you have classes like to let them know how to do their projects or how to make their projects successful. But my teacher slots out basically one day. So Tuesday, Thursday, we have Tuesdays where we meet all together and then Thursdays are optional. So um, in my case, I have three other people in my group and our schedules are very busy. Three of us are graduating either in May or December. So as you guys might understand, that's a lot of work coming up on us. Um, and so we use that Thursday time to meet. I understand like with not every class you're able to do that, especially if you have a lot of material and a lot of information to give to students. Um, but that's something that I, you know, didn't really even know going into the class that it was going to be a thing. And then as it became a thing, I realized that all of our schedules were pretty jumbled and she gives us that slot to meet with our students. Um, like I said, I'm not 100% sure like what you teach or what kind of research um, that you're having students do, um, but that's just been something that's been benefiting for my class. Maybe not every Thursday or every Wednesday um, or whatever days that you have your classes, because obviously if you have material to teach, you need to teach it to them. Um, but maybe giving them that option, you know, maybe every other week having a day where they have that time slot where they can go to the class or they can go, um, you know, to the RSC or go somewhere on Zoom or something just to give them that time together, because I do understand that it's a time crunch right now, even for me, especially with all the organizations I was involved in. And I know students are involved in their organizations and their multiple classes and stuff. Um, but that's just been something that has been, I'm very grateful that my professor has given us this opportunity in our class. Yeah, I love that. Thank you. That I think that actually probably would work. So I'll have to consider that. Thanks so much. Well, I would say as far as group work, the one thing that I've noticed it does is uh, you get to know your classmates better when you get separated into groups because you start interacting with each other and you don't really get a chance to do that uh, during a lecture. Uh, one place that I saw the most was in uh, Spanish. We were separated into groups and got to practice with each other, and it wasn't as embarrassing as getting up in front of the whole class. So in that respect, it helped. Plus, like I say, just getting to know your classmates, it makes the class, the whole class kind of more energized. On this group question, you know, we've had uh, several of these um, series on teaching and Tom is here with us today and what the group question has come up um, repeatedly when we start talking about active learning and 
he uses a technique in his class that um, utilizes the group, but rotates that group and who's discussing within that group. Um, so they start off with one group, they move, they move to another group, and then the person that's a spokesperson, I, I'm probably not explaining this well, Tom, but it is a technique that not one person in the, each group feels like they're going to be the person that has to speak. It shares that responsibility of um, who's talking, who's sharing, and it it is one of the active learning techniques that Tom talked about when we talked about active learning. I think that was last, no, was that last week that we did that discussion or was it the week before? I can't remember, we've done so many of these in the last uh, month, but yes, it was a technique. And if you'll um, go back or if you'll contact me, I can get that information to you or you can contact Tom about that. Do I have another question from the audience? Don't see any hands up. What do you What do you really want to know? What's your burning question? Yes, David. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, so, Laura, you mentioned starting off in fall of nineteen, and obviously being here during the dreaded pivot uh, to online learning. And um, I was just wondering if you can speak. You and 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 your other panelists can speak to. Are there things that maybe your professors learned during that time that they have carried over to uh, how they're teaching their classes now? And, and maybe um, whether you think those learned techniques have improved the, uh, the, the teaching or if they've made it worse? There's a couple things I've noticed. One on a more personal level and the second on a more academic level. Personally, I think professors are more open to understanding that students have personal issues and personal lives and maybe they don't need to know every single detail of that. And there's this more open discussion of like online classes being accessible. So if you're going through something, there's that accessibility component that COVID has created. But then, you know, second of all, I think that, I don't know. I think the teaching method has changed so much now that teachers, I feel like there's more flexibility. They're more adaptable. And even the older professors are getting more adaptable to student learning and being able to adjust their lessons plans or their course curriculum to suit the needs of the students and what we're currently going through. So I, I, I think I'll follow up with, with the, the panel on that. There is a lot of discussion around, should we have online or should it be face-to-face -face or should it be hybrid? So there's been, several discussions that have been floated around. So what should our teaching modalities be going forward? Well, I'd say if you want to go away from face to face, you might as well just learn on YouTube. OK. Uh, you can't replace having a face to face with your professors and your classmates, especially in philosophy. Uh, the discussion, which thankfully we have smaller classes uh, in a lot of those where everybody can put their two cents in. And just one thing I'd have to say about Dr. Hepburn is once he found out what my passion, my passion was, he gave me uh, inspiration to study outside of what we were studying in class and it turned into uh, some good work I think I think and, it's and okay. a little bit of money if I recall correctly sorry yes <laughs> <laughs> I think it's tricky um because I have I think four online class four online classes and one in-person class this semester 
And I know that for, especially, like I said, I work in the political science department and I know that there's faculty that do only online classes because it works for their schedule. And, you know, I think that that benefit of it's really great for students and faculty. Um, it works around pretty easily, especially some of my classes are asynchronous. So it's not like I'm on Zoom. It's just like the Blackboard classes. Um, with that being said, I do agree that it does get hard to get that material and, you know, getting that educational benefit that you get from that in-person learning. If, if I'm struggling on this end, yes, I can send my professor an email, but they're reading words on a screen, you know, very seldom, you know, can I set up a Zoom with them, but it's not like they can really grasp that I'm struggling. They just are reading the words, hey, I need help with X, Y, Z. Can you explain it to me? And hopefully when they explain it to me, it maybe makes a little bit more sense than what I'm reading in the book or what I'm reading from other students. It gets tricky. I really think it depends on the class. And I, I, I can't even say which classes are good for it and bad for it because it really is just a complicated thing that we're trying to adapt to and grow with post COVID. Um, I have one class right now that's online that I maybe would have been better in person. I'm, I'm trucking along, I'm doing it but maybe this class would have been better on person, but all my other classes, I'm not struggling. I'm doing well and I'm getting the education that I feel like I, is necessary to do well in the class. I'm doing well in the class. Um, it, it, it's a really tricky thing. I feel like if you, you know, paying attention to how many students are past failing this online class, is it, you know, a pretty significant percentage of students that are maybe getting like season below maybe this is something that should be an in-person class or maybe you have a lot of students that are getting a's and b's in this online class well you know something's something's right something's going okay in this class because students are able to retain this information do well on your quizzes do well on your exams your papers whatever assignments you have um but just you know maybe reaching out to students hey how's everyone doing and it's online so i'm not gonna lie and say when my professors have reached out to like the announcements that i maybe don't say anything regardless but I think just paying attention to the grades, paying attention to how many students are actually doing these assignments and doing the discussion boards and just all the factors of it. I would like to add, like from a double major perspective. So with my psychology degree, I've taken, I would say about 80% of my classes online. And I've actually really enjoyed that a lot. I think it's very convenient because most of my political science classes are in person. And so it gives me that flexibility of being able to work on things on my own time and then also having that collaborative discussion when it comes to like public policies or government or law. Those kinds of conversations are very fruitful with peers, but in psychology it's very straightforward and it's very textbook so that has been more beneficial for me. Yeah, you know, the, the reason I asked this question was. When we started, I asked the question, what will stand out for you? And the resounding answer was relationship. And so I wanted to see how that relationship is built either online or face to face. Now, I don't know who who's first. Is it Tom or is it Mariah? OK, Mariah. Hi, um, we had a panel last week of high school teachers, and one of the things that kind of stood out to me um, about kind of the incoming freshmen that we can expect next year was um, a lack of confidence. Now you guys maybe not in this class um, and I missed the beginning of the discussion. I, I got caught, caught up, but um, what are things that professors can do to instill more confidence in freshmen that are coming in next year? Uh, what kinds of things worked for you. And then a kind of a second question, if, if we have time, um, is uh, assignment deadlines. I don't know if you've talked about that yet, um, but I know that that was another thing, I think in high schools and maybe during COVID, we've been giving grace and basically doing away with deadlines. And in my experience, I feel like students need deadlines to help them keep on track. And I don't teach any online classes. So I don't know if this is very different in online classes, but if you could comment on your experience and perspectives on having deadlines versus no deadlines or something in between. I will, I will say like, I'm definitely a deadline person. I need a deadline or else like, if you say turn it in whenever, I'm turning it in whenever, whenever. And that's because you said I could. But that being said, I think that the confident portion is really interesting because this has been a discussion about assertiveness 
whether students are able to ask questions, raise their hand, start conversation, initiate relationships. You know, I've seen it firsthand with a lot of the younger students. And I, it's, it's insane to me um, how reserved people are nowadays. Um, people are not open to asking questions or engaging in conversation as much with strangers. And that's been really difficult to overcome. But I think that ultimately professors have like the most immediate and direct impact on students because they have firsthand experience and interaction with them. And so instilling confidence in them is like little nudges, telling them that they're doing great work, telling them that they're improving or noticing small things about them and engaging in that conversation and boosting that confidence and just guiding them. Like if you notice they're doing really well or they're very interested in a particular topic, pushing them towards that direction will give them the confidence they need to just do it themselves. There's certainly a thin line between being a friend and being an instructor because you want to, I think, let them know you can be a friend, but not let them take advantage of that. Because when I was introductory classes, they're so large, at least they were in the 70s, that I, I never approached a professor at all. I just, I felt like, uh, I would be bothering them. So if you can just give them the attitude of you can talk to me and uh, I'm not gonna bite your head off. It's, it's uh, pretty tough when you're a youngster to have the confidence that, but I, lowering standards is not gonna get you there. I, expectations I feel like I'm in the middle so like I definitely agree that like especially when like faculty when professors compliment my work um it makes me want to do better it makes me say okay they're paying attention to me versus just like seeing that grade go in the grade book and that's it like that really just kind of just pushes me along just like a normal class so when professors take the time to say this is really great great work, you know, like Laura said, I noticed you've been doing really well, you're understanding the material, or like if you notice a student struggling, like, hey, reach out to them. Um, in terms of deadlines, I am also in the middle. I do I, I do believe in having set deadlines because as a, I'm a type A personality, so I have everything in my little agenda right next to me, everything set out. That's not how all students are. Um, but I also understand from a, a disability services standpoint, I have accommodations. And so I understand there are times where those deadlines need to be extended a little bit. Um, and I personally don't think students take advantage of that. Like I said, this is my personal experience. I don't know how you guys experience, um, you know, students maybe asking for that extended time or, you know, maybe not turning in assignments when they should be. But in my experience in my classes and the things that I've heard from my professors is that most students, when they ask for this extension, they usually need it. It's not like they're just being lazy. It's not that they're, you know, just not wanting to do the work. Most of the time, it's usually they got something going on in their own lives. And as professors, you know, it's like, like Eric said, it's different for being a friend and a faculty. But if you notice a student that's kind of struggling a little bit more, maybe personally or academically extending that, like saying, hey, you know, I don't have to know what's going on in your life, but I'm here for you. And if you need this extra help, or if you need you know, an extra tutoring session or an extra office hours, like I'm here for you. And like extending that, I feel like makes all the difference. It raises their confidence. It raises their ability to say, okay, you know what? I can do this work, but if I need to take a step back, like I know my faculty, I know my professor is understanding and compassionate enough to understand that just like them, I'm a human being too, and things happen. And it's hard. I do understand, like, I know as a professor, you might get students that just don't turn in work or they, you know, they, I feel like maybe in your experience, you guys have more students not turn in work than ask for debt, like extensions. And so if you have students asking for extensions and needing that extra grace period, I mean, like I said, I'm, it's coming from an accommodation standpoint, like a disability st services standpoint. So maybe I'm a little biased. Um, but it has really like made the difference in my whole academic career to understand that 
I very rarely use those accommodations as well, but when I need them, not every student has that ability to get those documentations. They maybe they don't have insurance to go get, you know, labeled with all these like ADHD or whatever's like struggling, they're struggling with, but understanding that, oh, this professor understands me and they know that if I need help, I can go to them and say, I need this grace period. It, it really means a lot. Thank you. I, I would just add that being an older person and having been out in the working world, deadlines are something you're going to have to deal with. So when you leave here as a graduate, you should know that they are necessary because you're not going to get second chances. You're not going to get extensions out there. Thank, thank you, Eric. Um, Tom, I think you're, you have a question. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about, um, you know, as far as students being able to communicate with the professors and kind of get feedback to them, um, have you had professors that use other methods than just waiting to the end of the year for an SPTE to fill out, like maybe an in-class, like maybe a question on an exam that you fill out, or even just uh, some sort of evaluation they hand out to you in class or as part of Blackboard to get feedback? And if so, ha have you seen any sort of realized change from that, maybe some things that are more effective than others? With Dr. Bondi, I've had uh, a pretty good rapport, I think the whole class did, uh, so that it kind of was in progress. And Dr. Hep uh, yeah, Dr. Hepburn as well, of course, he was advisor when I was uh, with the Philosophy Society, so we had several talks and uh, it just, it wasn't a concerted effort, it just happened. Um, I think that, you know, I've had a little bit of a different experience with this. I think adjunct professors are better at asking for feedback than actual professors because they're, you know, they only usually teach for about a semester a year. And so, you know, they don't have as much of a workload and they're also just kind of like feeling out what each class um, needs from the teacher and what suits them the best. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, Dr. Shaw does a really good job of asking us if we're, you know, on the right track or whether we're, you know, we're going to actually do the content she asked us to do. Like she asked us the other day if we were actually going to watch the movie. And, you know, most students are not. And I appreciate that, like, she wants that open discussion because there's a lot of things that students just are not going to be interested in. And some professors just need to get it through to their heads of, like, students are not interested in this method and it's archaic. Like, we're going in a very different direction in our generation. And I think that sometimes teachers really do need to take a step back and acclimate to that. Thank you. And I think we have time for maybe one more question. And David, see that your hand's up. So, hi, I'm going to ask a, uh, a sort of practical follow-up to, uh, to Dr. Beck's question about deadlines. Um, so, when I started teaching, anytime I had an assignment due, it was due during class at the time that I was teaching the class. Um, and of course, now a lot of assignments are turned in online and certainly um, was true during COVID. And, and uh, so my question is, do you prefer the deadline set to be midnight or do you prefer a deadline that's set like at five o'clock? Um, obviously, the midnight deadline means that you have extra time, but you know, you don't get as much sleep. So I was curious of what you uh, what what your thoughts were on on what a good deadline is for assignments. Well, when I see a deadline at eleven fifty nine p.m., that's fine. If I see, I have to like I'm I'm used to eleven fifty nine. So if I I have to like really check, and I love when professors they change it. I have one class that's like stuff to do at noon, stuff to do at um like you said 5 p.m and so I have to really be like careful with these classes I'm like okay I have to make sure regardless I usually turn in stuff early in the first place but if I you know 
don't, I have to really be careful with these ones. And so I prefer 1159. You're right. It does give extra time. Plus, I feel like more students are just used to this time slot. I have to agree because for me, when a professor has something due before class or yeah, like due before class, to me, it just doesn't really make sense, especially if like the assignment is not pertinent to the discussion in class, then why is the assignment have to be due before class? Especially if I have a question about the assignment or I'd like to listen to the material in class and then add it into my assignment later, I think that's more beneficial. And also, you know, if students are gonna procrastinate till midnight, that is on them. That is completely on them. If they lose sleep over it, that is on them. They are responsible for that, not the professors. And so I think having that midnight deadline, that 1159 is just perfect. Well, when it comes to the deadlines time, I would, I always try to be done well before midnight, but when I, had that midnight deadline a lot of times especially on a philosophy paper i hesitate to turn in that draft until if i've got time i'll go over it and i'll go over it and i'll go over it and there's always some changes you can make you if you went the next day you could make changes so i've i've made use of that time to do some changing but I don't think it makes a whole lot of difference. I know Dr. Bondi would have us turn in our reading uh, assessments before class so that when you're in class, he knows you read the material and when you're discussing it, everybody is on board. Uh, the ones that didn't get it done, then they were sitting there in class kind of clueless. So. So I think we're going to wrap this up with one last question from Cheryl Miller. My question is for each of the panelists, what is one thing you would like people in this meeting who have instructional responsibilities, what is one thing that you would like for them to take with them from this meeting? Well, the people that I've dealt with should know they've been a huge benefit to my life and that everything they've done for me is appreciated. I would just like to say you guys should really remember that like you guys have a huge impact and you you have to decide whether that's going to be a positive or negative impact on each and every student that you meet and see. You can either stand there and change their lives or you can just continue on with yours. But this, the professors who in very intentionally make it a point to positively impact students truly make a difference. They change people's lives. They change the trajectory of everybody around them. And if you want to be that positive change, then you can be. Um, something that I would encourage you guys to take with you is that remembering that while you guys have things going on in your lives, so do we as students. Um, and there's a lot of factors involved in that, whether that's attendance, whether that's grades, whether that's assignments, and just reaching out to students if they need that help. If they, if you've noticed a student, you know, not coming to class regularly, just shoot them an email or, you know, try to reach out. Like if they don't reach out back, that's on them. You know, you did your part. That's all you can do. Like Laura said, just being that positive impact on them because it really does. It it really does make the difference. And it's it's a wonderful thing when you have faculty and staff that care about you as a person and see you as somebody that they want to help and they care about as a human being in general. So I think before we go, I, yes. I don't want to leave uh, Dr. Dufresne out. His class was probably one of the most fun classes I've ever been in. So from the panel today, I, I think you see why I wanted them to speak to our faculty today. They have um, been open, honest. They have told us information that maybe we don't often hear about the importance of relationship, the importance of communication. And 
we are we we came here because we're passionate about our subjects and we want to share it with others. So um, in closing, I want to just thank my students um, for being on the advisory board this year. This is this is why we have an advisory board, because we want to hear from our students and what's going well, what's not, what can we do better? And so I'm looking forward to next year. And with your help, we'll find people like yourselves that will be open and honest about what's going well, what's not, and help lead the Dean's office and the college um, forward. So thank you all for being here. Oh, Cheryl, I think Cheryl and Andrew have something to, to close out with. I'll just uh, quickly say to the students here that um, we're in the business of learning, but we all are. So these moments are so valuable to us and that's why you got those very specific questions from instructors they want to they want to do better um, and so we're listening to you very carefully we're going to try and take what you've said and move forward with it you know that we're all about uh, retention and student success and a lot of that starts in the in the classroom and when Laura said that quite frightening thing which was you either have a, in, basically an impact for good or for ill uh, we need to um, really pay attention to that. And I'd also like to thank you for all the advice that you give me and you have given me for the last year. It's it's just a huge benefit um, to the college. Um, I uh, <laughs> want to, yeah, thank you, Laura. So I, I want to bring in Cheryl here because um, Cheryl is going to tell us all about how you can review or revisit all the sessions <laughs> of these episodes. So over to you, Cheryl, tell us how we do that. Um, the each of the uh, perspectives presentations will be available on the college YouTube video channel, uh, and that's you just go to YouTube and you type in Fairmount College and it pops right up. Um, by the end of uh, this week, this um, this session will be uploaded. The other three are already up there, so if anyone wants to review them, they can check them out. Thank you all. It's been a ter terrific series. You have a great rest of your week. And thank you.